Hello again, and welcome back to chapter three of Ignite Love. And today we are going to be reading this story that is written by uh, Katerina Amadora. And uh, Katerina has a spiritual temple uh, that is uh, over in the East Bay in San Francisco, California. I am uh, going to be uh, actually doing a workshop there on Valentine's weekend. I'm going to be doing a three hour introduction to energy sex workshop. And a little bit later that evening, uh, we're going to be doing a snuggle party. So being able to get close and being able to have some wonderful um, non-sexual intimacy. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it uh, this coming uh, Saturday, the 12th of February. Uh, so uh, Katerina's uh, chapter in the book is called Dancing with Love. And her quote is, how you show up on the dance floor is how you show up in life. One of the things I find interesting about that title is it uh, reminds me of a dance instructor who once shared with a class that a lot of women equate watching a guy out on the dance floor and how good or how poor he would actually perform sexually in the bedroom. So uh, Katarina's intention for his chapter, love is a dance that carries you through life. Partners may change, but if you find joy in the dance, you will never be alone. My intention is that you fall more and more deeply in love with yourself every day. I pray that you look in the mirror each day with love in your heart, seeing the deep soul beauty of the person who looks back at you. Seeing the deep soul. Seeing the soul deep beauty of the person who looks back at you. May you carry this energy through your day, dancing through life and magnetically attracting all the love that you deserve and more. That's something that I can actually do and implement on a daily basis that I haven't, is actually looking myself in the mirror and just being with me. I, I do it in fleeting glances on occasion, though there's something romantic about the idea of being able to go and do that intentionally. I uh, once talked to a woman a couple months ago who told me that she was a, a single polyamorous woman. And she said that she wakes up next to her beloved soulmate every single day. Because every morning when she wakes up, she grabs the mirror off of her nightstand and looks herself in the eye and says, hello, beautiful. I love you. I thought that is an awesome way to have a good relationship with yourself, or at least one way that will help you have an awesome relationship with yourself. Because ultimately, I'm the only one who's guaranteed to be with me through my entire life. So I get to make my relationship with me a priority. And you have the right to make your relationship with you a priority too. So starting with the story for tonight, Dancing with Love. I remember the first day that I walked into, into Sweets Ballroom in Oakland, California. It was a Sunday morning. I had heard about ecstatic dance from a friend in Portland years ago, but it was on the east side of the city that I lived across the river in Northwest Portland. Somehow I could never get myself out of the house that early on a Sunday morning to drive across the bridge and check it out. Now here I was back from Shanghai and living in the San Francisco Bay area again, after two of the most stressful years of my life, finally finding my way to ecstatic dance. I've been to a couple of ecstatic dances out in uh, Sedona, Arizona. 
quite interesting. <laughs> uh, one constant companion that, that carries me through the challenging years that I spent moving from place to place and country to country every couple of years had been dance. Every time I've been required to uproot myself and my family to follow my husband's career, my saving grace had been finding and connecting with a dance community. In each new location from Singapore to the Bay Area, from Portland to Shanghai and back to the Bay, dance had been my refuge. It gave me a place to find community, to connect with sisters, to have somewhere I felt at home. As long as I had a place to dance, I felt that I belonged. The community of women who danced resonated with me in a way that touched my soul. It gave me a way to find new friends each time my family moved because there was a universal call that brought us together. I didn't consider myself to be a good dancer. I was not as nimble as I once had been. I've been dancing for over 20 years and all those years, the dancer I was in my head rarely manifested herself in reality. Bad knees prevented me from doing many of the things that younger dancers could do. Yet my love of dance kept coming back, kept me coming back for more. I kept trying. I welcomed opportunities to perform and sought out different teachers who could push me to the next level. On a few occasions, this led to having a breakdown on the dance floor in tears at the back of a class, unable to go on. I cursed my body for what it could not do. In spite of this, I never gave up. I always came back the next week, the next day, determined to master the choreography and to gain the muscle memory that was required to be able to reach the next level in dance. It was never my intention to be a professional dancer. I danced because dance was life. It was the canvas through which I was exposed uh, what was inside of me, the good, the bad, the ugly. I tried performing, getting over the fear of being on stage, endeavoring to get the moves perfect in ensemble pieces, despite towering above other dancers. I found that this type of roach choreography did challenge me, yet it did not call my soul. I love solo dancing because I could improvise. I could allow the music to flow through me and inspire my movements without having to look like the younger, more agile dancers. I found dance as an expression of my soul. On that particular fall day, I had finally made my way to ecstatic dance knowing that my soul craved the creative release that dance gave me. I came into Sweet's Ballroom, this beautiful, huge art deco ballroom that was one of the earliest homes of ecstatic dance in the United States. I remember tentatively looking around, how amazing that I could be so close to the oldest and largest ecstatic dance communities in America. Talking was actively discouraged on the dance floor and people would hush you if you tried to start a conversation. I hardly knew anyone. How could I even learn their names if we could not talk? My years of dancing helped me to overcome my shyness as I joined in the dance. I found release after months of trauma, having to hold space for a daughter who seemed hell bent on hurting herself, cutting, suicide attempts and a husband who valued his career over keeping our family together. I remember noticing one particular guy that day who did not seem fit, did not seem to fit in. He was not dancing. He was hanging around the edge of the room. I saw him looking at some bags and went over to check on mine. Everything was okay. There was my iPad mini and a dance belt and as well as a few other items. I left my bag on the side of the room and went back to dance. It was liberating, transporting me for a few hours away from the stress of daily life. At the end of the dance, I went uh, back to gather my things. Something was wrong. My iPad was not in my bag. It was gone. 
I went to the organizer and another woman uh, was already there reporting that her wallet had been stolen. After that beautiful day of dancing and reconnecting to the music, we spent the next hour in the Oakland Police Department reporting the theft. Someone else might not have come back to Sweet's Ballroom. They may have stayed home, fearful of taking another chance. In spite of this negative experience, the next Sunday, I was there again, undeterred. I was careful not to bring anything valuable inside this time, but I knew my soul needed this. I needed to be here as much as a person in the desert needed water. In those early days of dancing with this community, I still felt a bit like an outsider. I knew very few names, yet I came to know their faces. I often found myself looking around, wanting to initiate a dance with someone, not quite yet knowing how. Sometimes someone would approach me, which would be blissful, playful, even sexy. Sometimes I was successful in initiating dance with someone else, yet other times I would try to make a connection and the other person would gesture, namaste, and back away. A universal sign indicating that they were not open to dancing. Part of me would collapse, berating myself for doing it wrong, for not reading the cues right. It, I made it mean that there was something wrong with me, that they were not open to partnering. It didn't stop me though. I kept coming back for more. <sighs> yeah, I feel that. And yeah, when you take the courage to try to approach someone and, and they say no, even if it's a beautiful, loving, and graceful no, it can still hurt sometimes. And I've had a challenge taking things like that personally. It's a practice to learn how to trust that people are taking care of themselves and doing what is right for them, including saying no to me. And that's okay because they're allowed to say no, just as I'm allowed to say no to anything that's asked of me also. I've taken dance shops from many teachers. In one class, I learned the nonverbal cues to look for to see if someone was open to dance. This workshop, led by a professional West Coast swing dancer by the name of Shalanta Davis, was a wonderful introduction of how to communicate on the dance floor. She led a beautiful dynamic exploration which allowed me to play with varying levels of connection from marrying someone to exploring dance in their negative space. And then from there, how to initiate connection in a non-threatening way, how to feel into the degrees of connection that, that someone was open to. Another workshop called Dance is Life, Gabriel uh, Francisco uh, taught me to play with the energy of my dance, exploring all types of movements that we had access to from the playful to the sublime. His Dance's Life workshop opened new realms of playfulness to my dance and turned me on to how energy can be used in dance as you connect with another. It was wonderful and he remains one of my favorite teachers to this day. Most importantly, I discovered shamanic fusion dance with Anahanda Ray as I attended her very first serpent ceremony five years ago. I knew I had been called to this work. In that ceremony, I experienced intuitive technique for the first time. A moving exploration of the body through the six body systems from the outermost fingers, toes, and top of head in toward the center of the body, the spine. My body resonated so much with this new way of moving, it felt like every muscle was lit from within with an inner fire. Our, what, our waking dreams meditation that day seemed to be a message. My teacher, Sedona Soulfire from Portland, had led me there, and I saw her white wolf dog in my meditation, a symbol that told me that this was destined. 
it was not an easy path. I did not have the flexibility that younger dancers had, and there are many things I could not do. I had a particularly hard time with floor work because of my knees, and occasionally some of Anahana's feedback was difficult for my fragile ego to accept. I always knew that what she said was for my growth, yet sometimes it was hard to hear. I so desperately wanted her approval. I wanted to dance and to perform with the younger dancers, yet the pain in my body stopped. Yet the pain in my body stopped me. <sighs> I still remember the day that I had to make the difficult decision to let go of my dream of being part of the performance troupe. We were working on a piece that involved three dancers standing in a row as one, with a dancer in the second position serving as arms for the first. Because of my height, I had to be in front, yet I could not contort my arms into the position that was required to make this work visually. I also had to bend my knees to bring myself closer to the height of the dancer behind me. This was painful. I finally had to tell Alejandra that I just could not do it. Over the next several months, I watched the development of the dance to which I was to have been a part of. It was powerful. It was performed on the stage at the last tribal fest and it was one of the most powerful pieces of the entire event. Sometimes letting something go that you want and saying, this isn't the right fit for me, allows a space for those who are meant to be there and what is a good fit to actually come in. And beauty and magic can happen from that. It's still sad sometimes. He wants the right thing. And it's okay. In spite of having to drop my aspiration to be part of the performance troupe, I kept coming back. My tenacity kept uh, Anna Honda ended up investing her time in me. Even when my stubborn nature would lead to conflict, she came to respect me because I kept doing the work. Dancing with her in the serpent ceremony, I learned the fundamentals of shamanic fusion dance. Intuitive technique unlocked my body in profound yet subtle ways allowing me to move from a much more intuitive place, getting me out of my head and into my body. This gave me a flow that translated into the dance floor at ecstatic dance in any other place where I choose to dance. I learned to dive into that place of silent knowing where I became one with the music, not its slave, but rather using the structure of the music and its many layers as a playground that I could explore. My love of dance helped fill a void in me that I didn't even know I had. I'd always looked for love and approval outside of myself, but it's like a person looking for their keys outside under the light when they've lost them in the dark house. As my dancing evolved, I saw this translate into the dance floor at Ecstatic Dance. I could feel the way my dancing began to blossom. I tried to get to Swede ballrooms as often as I could to get my Sunday fix. I loved starting my week with dance as it always put me into the flow in such a wonderful way. Walking out of dance each Sunday, I would feel almost like I was floating on air. When I could do what I love, I would carry me through, through my week in such a wonderful way. Month by month, as we dove deeper, I came to know more and more about myself. Sometimes we would do waking dreams, which is a form of moving meditation that allows a person to discover things about themselves, which lie buried deep within the subconscious mind and thereby repattern them. Layer by layer, I healed old stories, old wounds, traumas that I carried since childhood. Occasionally things came up in the tribe that were sometimes uncomfortable, but these two brought subconscious patterns to light so I could look at them and heal them. 
transformation is like a spiral path. Relationships bring up your triggers so you can see them and heal them. Whether it is in romantic partnership, in family relationships, or in my dance community, it's all the same. Every relationship is a mirror. It shows you what you need to heal. When you see something in another that bothers you, understanding that in pointing your finger at another, there are always three fingers pointing back at you. Three, one. Yep, comes back to me. Always comes back to me. Instead of looking outside of yourself and judging others for what they are or are not doing, look inside. What part of you is being triggered by what you see? Be grateful to this person for giving you the gift of this opportunity to heal. When you do this, you take back your power and have the opportunity to respond from a conscious understanding rather than a reflective reflex, than a reactive reflex. These were uncomfortable lessons that I learned about myself, understanding where I had given away my power by blaming others or playing the victim. Ceremony by ceremony, I shed these layers, coming to understand myself more deeply and accessing where in my body this trauma had been stored. In every moment, we each have the opportunity to choose love, to embody love, and to take full responsibility for how we show up. There is power in this. As you fully own your reactions and your responses, you take back your power. You become unflappable, or as a favorite mentor of mine says, unfuckwithable. Uh, through my years of training with Anahanda, uh, I have continued on my spiral path. Time after time, uh, I will find my way back to the same trigger, each time wondering, haven't I healed this yet? This is the nature of all transformation. It's like an onion. Each layer that you peel away brings you closer to your true self. Eventually, like an onion, each layer is usually cleaner than the last, yet sometimes it takes a while before you get to the core of the problem or the belief. Eventually, the goal is to come into closer alignment with the person who you were meant to be. <sighs> One of the things that it brings up for me is I found that when I thought I resolved an issue, the universe will bring that issue around again at least one more time, being like, okay. Did you really get this? Let's see how you apply it in this situation. And I've also learned that in my own personal growth, that when something comes up that I thought I had taken care of, thought I had resolved, like, for example, feelings of anger, resentment, hatred towards my mother, that I, it is an indication that I have grown, that while I did do that healing and that work to the level and depth I was able to at that point in time, but I'm now grown so my inner realm has expanded and I can go and access things I wasn't able to before. And sometimes that means redoing or doing on a deeper level some of the inner work that I've previously done. And that's okay. It's part of the process and part of life. It's normal, there's nothing wrong. As I have danced through these years with so many amazing dancers and mentors influencing me, I've come to see the dance floor as a microcosm of all life and all relationships. How you are on the dance floor is how you show up in life. How you do anything is how you do everything. <laughs> it's another way that I've heard it put by other mentors of mine. Do you dance to the beat of a different drummer? Are you tuned to the others around you? Are you oblivious, bumping into others like a bull in a chiny shop? Actually, Mythbusters did, did go and bust that myth like, 
a bull put into a china shop will actually be very graceful and not going to run into anything as long as it actually has you know a area that is wide enough for its physical body to go and pass through bulls are actually very graceful <laughs> are you timid and meek are you respectful of others do you dare to take up space can you unapologetically can you be unapologetically you while still honoring and respecting the space of others around you. It's something I get to remind myself of is I'm worthy and deserving to take up space, to have my energy be out there and to be felt. And sometimes it boggles my mind thinking like, if I'm going taking up the space and putting my energy out there and so are other people, how is this also going to take into consideration the, the space of others and having a space for them. I don't have a perfect answer for that as of yet. And I've also gotten reflections of the times when I have literally let my energy fill the room and take up the space that I can because I can and I'm able to, that people liked that and they liked who they experienced me being when I allowed myself to actually be my, my fuller self. <sighs> Things I get to remind myself of. Once again, everything being a mirror, this book, these stories being mirrors for me, which is kind of the whole reason why myself and my fellow authors um, went and wrote this book in the first place. So I'm glad to be sharing it with you now. Oh, where were we in this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> to me, the dance floor is like swimming through eddies of energy, playing in the current, relating with others, and then letting go. All the work I have done on and off the dance floor has helped me to recognize how I've always been looking for approval outside of myself. It's helped me to see that sometimes in reaching for connection, you push it away whether on the dance floor or in a relationship, but when you grasp at what you want, it eludes you. People can feel that grasping energy, even if you are not aware of what you're doing. It comes from a space of lack. And when people feel, and when people feel this push-pull energy, they pull away. Whether you are on the dance floor or dancing through life, the skills of non-attachment will serve you well. When you finally feel comfortable dancing and being in your own skin, it becomes contagious. You may not be for everyone, but those who see your light, who behold the unbridled joy in your dance, will gravitate to you. You will not need to chase when you desire it. Uh, when you, you will not need to chase what you desire as it will come to you. This may take patience uh, when you can be in your yum, when you can finally let go with joy and dance with all that love in your heart, the right type of people will be drawn to your light. Last year in November, I hired a business coach to go and help me put together my summit that I did, the Enlightened Consent Summit. And one of the things that he taught me was the idea of actually connecting to my joy and brought me through a meditation to actually connect to me and help me remember what it was like to actually be joyful, which had been quite a while since I actually felt joy. Then he gave me a task, which I think is a great thing. <laughs> I, I have yet to really fully implement or do consistently, which is to first find the joy within myself and then take actions from that joyful place. I do believe and have experienced that when I'm doing something from a place of joy, that there's a different quality and unspoken communications and energies are going to come across 
being in that joy first instead of doing something that's from the head or doing something for because we have to and perhaps being a little bit upset or resentful or trying to go and get a certain reaction get to a certain place it doesn't quite have the same quality to it never dim your radiance for anyone radiate your love and light so brilliantly that you become a supernova take joy from the pure pleasure of being in your body on this planet at this time shine your radiance so bright that others can sunbathe in it when you can do this you can live ecstatically in love and joy you can let go of grasping for what you want because you will attract those who are aligned with your vibration <sighs> i'm taking a moment to breathe that in something that I've wanted to be true for a long time and something that I'm trusting still is true even at times when I don't trust that the world wants or can handle the full me I still get to let my light shine I still get to love me Mm. it's okay i'm okay you can let go of grasping for what you want because you will attract those who are aligned with your vibration i know that sometimes waiting for the right person to find you can be frustrating we are social creatures we are healthier and happier when in community and in relationship with each other. Just remember that your most important relationship is with the person in the mirror. Yes, it is. Love him or her or them, my fellow non binaries. <laughs> Accept him or her or them. Praise him or her or them. When you love yourself unapologetically, you teach others how it should be done. You become unfuckable with. When you can do that, you can create any life you wish. Another thing that comes up for me with that part is the idea that you get to be the example of the world of how to treat you, your relationship with you and how you treat yourself is the model that other people will often look at in how to go and treat you and relate to you how do you want to relate to yourself how do you want others to relate to you they are very intertwined ignite action steps get out and move your body <laughs> whether you dance do yoga or other forms of exercise does not matter Moving your body helps you to come into your body more fully. When you're fully embodied, you can be more present and more able to handle whatever comes at you. Being embodied also makes you more attractive to others. Being in your body helps, definitely. Seek out opportunities to dance, particularly in drug and alcohol-free environments such as ecstatic dance or five rhythms. Use these dance floors as laboratories to explore how you relate to others. Notice your responses when someone initiates contact with you or when you initiate contact with others. What comes up for you? You can learn much about yourself in this moving laboratory. Sign up for contact improv classes. Get outside your comfort zone. Learn from different teachers. Learn to love your body and be grateful for how it carries you through life. Nourish it well and take care of yourself. Meditate, do mirror work. Start a gratitude practice. Create a vision for what you want in partnership and don't settle for anything less than what you really want. 
It's the end of our third chapter. I am enjoying this. I hope you are enjoying this as well. And I invite you to put down in the comments of what came up for you during this chapter. I'll see you again soon, tomorrow. I still have this commitment doing this on a daily basis, right? Yep. Made it three days in a row so far. Yay. Okay. Going to keep on going. You are loved. All is well. Bye for now.